Sally Helgeson, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you, Holly. It's wonderful to be with you. So we're talking about your, your new book, Rising Together. So I'd love to begin by just get, introducing you to my audience. Like, maybe just give us your, your elevator pitch about who, who you are and uh, kind of what, what, what you do. Well, yeah, I'm Sally Helgeson, and I have been uh, writing about and uh, delivering programs on women's leadership and inclusive leadership all around the world for the last 35 years. Um, so both of those fields are of great interest to me, and uh, and they I see an overlap. The book that I did before, I've written, I think, nine books. Uh, the book I did before Rising Together was How Women Rise, which um, uh, how you noticed my Mongolian edition behind me on my bookcase. Uh, we did very well with that, uh, co-authored with uh, Marshall Goldsmith. And now I've written Rising Together, which sort of brings me back to the area of inclusion. Uh, in 1995, I wrote the first book that talked about inclusion in the business or workplace context, the web of inclusion. So now I'm going back and sort of exploring some of those themes in Rising Together. Um, but it's been a very, very gratifying uh, last 35 years of my career. Yeah. And I was um, surprised to find out that you had kind of coined the term inclusion when it comes to thinking about business and how that might be important. And, you know, in the book, you, in, this, in Rising Together, you give some hints about your past as a as a speech writer, and I'm cu I'm real curious. Like, if you go, like, however far back you want to go, what kind of got you into this line of work? Into, you know, just where where you are. Like, did you always want to do this as a kid, or where did you how how did you start? Well, I always w wanted to be a writer. I mean, I never even thought of anything else for myself from the start, and I won my state journalism prize. Uh, when I was in high school, and so I had always been focused on on writing, and uh, studied it in college. Studied all of all the greats, and um, got into advertising first. Um, right out of you know, I took a break in in uh, college and moved to New York City and found myself working in the ad biz back in the <laughs> in the late '60s. It was. It really was like Madman. Let me tell you, it really, really was. It was an accurate depiction. So I wrote copy. I was the low person on the totem pole. I was very young. So I was writing like light bulb filament copy, things like that. Uh, then I was working as a freelance journalist for about uh, seven or eight years. And uh, I got very interested in business through some interviews that I'd done. I wrote a book on uh, independent oil producers in Texas, which was just a blast. I had so much fun doing that. So I got interested in, I, I wouldn't even say business so much as in organizations and how organizations function. And, uh, and, and so I ended up, uh, you know, doing some speech writing because I wanted to get inside some organizations. And when you're a speech writer, in, a, in essence, you're a journalist for the organization. And I worked with some really great companies, uh, just terrific companies, but it was the mid late 80s. And it was very clear to me that they had absolutely no idea how to understand what the women uh, in the companies could be contributing. I heard some of the best ideas uh, sitting around in the ladies lounge. <laughs> And uh, I kept thinking, there's got to be a way for these ideas to percolate up through the rest of the company. And I, so I was fascinated in what women could contribute. So I started writing about it. And the, I published a book in 1990, The Female Advantage, Women's Ways of Leadership. I was still doing a, being a speechwriter, but I pulled it together. Uh, through interviews, and uh, and it was the first book that looked at what women had to contribute as leaders, rather than how they needed to change and adapt. All through the 80s, all the books that were written for women who are flooding into the workplace, 
uh, whether they were academic or popular, took the point of view, you know, you, you're in the army now, if it moves, salute it, get with the program, leave your values at home, act like the guys. And this was the first to look at women's leadership strengths, what they could contribute, how, how it could be useful. So I think because that was the first, uh, companies started calling me and asking me to, to come in and talk to their women, et cetera. I took a leave of absence. And then I realized, I, you know, I'd rather be doing this for myself than writing speeches for guys who continued to read them off the slides at that point. We didn't use PowerPoint. We used transparencies, but the, um, you know, they seemed incapable of not reading them off the slides. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take, I give it a shot. I'll, I'll leave and I'll see if I can develop this. And so that was, you know, 35 years, 33 years ago. I never looked back uh, on that. It was a really good decision. It was a scary decision because I was doing well. But uh, I built that over the years. And, and then really thinking about the structures that the women had created in their companies, I saw that they were more web-like uh, and less hierarchical. Now, I'm not saying all women like, lead like this. They're terrible women leaders, just like they're terrible men leaders. But the women I was studying who were, who were both superb leaders and also women who, who felt that a lot of their leadership style was determined by the fact that they were women, uh, that, that, that it influenced how they did things. And that they, so they had more web-like organizations and that they were also very inclusive. So that was my next book, which had nothing to do with women. It was just looking at uh, the web of inclusion, a, a, a new architecture for building great organizations. And I was fascinated by this topic because I felt that the web was a much better structure for organizations, given how the technology was changing at that time. It was just the time when we were beginning to have personal computers and all the empowerment of employees that came with that. So that book, you know, put that word out there, inclusion. So between the two of those, they really, they really shaped my career going forward. Especially one other quick thing. Yeah. There was no tie in the book to the issue of diversity. It was really about, you know, unleashing the creativity and thinking power of people at all levels. But about two or three years after it came out, there was an increasing move to start departments of diversity or whole units in organizations that address diversity. And they, they began to pick up the word inclusion, which made sense. So diversity and inclusion became a thing. So then I started doing a ton of work in the diversity space because of having written this book on inclusion that really did not address diversity, but there was some use for it. How hey, so, I mean, when you started doing the work around, when you like, were first started talking to the women and seeing that they were sort of being systematically not included and had to kind of create their own structures and having come out of mad, out of Mad Men, what did what what did you think was at stake when you like what? Oh, I'll just I'll leave it there. What 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 was what was the, what were the problems like? Well, the chief problem was that I felt that number one, organizations were leaving so much talent on the table because they were not using the thinking, the ideas, the strategic. Uh, power of the women in their organizations. Uh, you know, it, it was a time of a lot of hierarchy. So there was this big division between heads and hands. And they were using women essentially as hands uh, without, you know, employing the power of their heads. And I felt that this was particularly poor uh, for organizations. Again, given the change in the nature of the technology, because it was much more networked, and it, it was a waste of talent. And I also felt that the whole society suffered when women could not reach their full potential. And the families suffered and communities suffered. 
uh, and women were experiencing a lot of frustration. We were no longer back in the sort of madman era. Women had a sense that they wanted to be part of this whole game of public life, uh, of, of how organizations were run. So the stakes felt very, very high to me. And uh, they still do, really. It, it's, it's, it's very, very important for women to have the power and the authority and the influence uh, that they want to have and can have rather than, um, you know, kind of keeping a lid on that. And, and, you know, to some extent, we're still doing it, but women now are really seriously fighting back. So one of the things that struck me about Rising Together is, is I was, you know, whenever, when I read a book that I really get immersed in, I think about, mm. like, how would I have written this and what, what would I have cared about? And, and it seems to me like if I were, if I were writing this, there's a, there's a huge yeah. tension between like who you're talking to, like, the, you know, which I, I can ask you, like my, my assumption was it's like, you know, women, because there's, there's a lot of advice for women about how to, you know, make it, how to have conversations in a certain way without rolling over or without escalating. And, and the tension is sort of, it's not their fault. Like, like there's such an imbalance in, like I, I, I almost wanted you to write a book like telling men to like shape up and rather than tell, making putting the onus on women, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, did, did oh, that do. tension come into to the issue? You know, I got that pushback with how women rise. Rising together was written specifically, and it was to help leaders and people. Number one, to help leaders. This is male or female leaders create organizations that are more inclusive, inclusive not just in terms of gender, but in race, ethnicity, um, you know, sexuality, sexual identity, age, uh, background, experience, values, et cetera. So we've got a whole range of, of categories of diversity now uh, to try to help leaders understand how to create more inclusive cultures by focusing on behavior, not so much bias. So that was one goal in this book. The other goal in this book was to uh, give individuals, whether man, men or women, uh, practices that could help them be more effective at building relationships broadly. So the target audience with Rising Together was not women, it was leaders and individuals, men and women, you know, how do we do this together to maximize talent. So that that was really the idea there. And in a way, you know, it's interesting that you say that, uh, because in 2012, I think, uh, my agent had suggested, I'd written a book called The Female Vision, Women's Real Power at Work, uh, which was about the differences in how men and women saw things and the perceptual differences and how that influenced leadership style and how organizations could benefit from understanding that. And my agent suggested, he said, you know, women really aren't the problem here. Men are the problem. Why don't you write a book about, you know, how men can, uh, what they need to know, what they need to understand, how they can be better champions and supporters for women. And uh, so we worked together on a proposal, spent quite some time on it. I felt like I had something good. I interviewed a lot of guys that I knew, you know, because men have been a key factor in my career development from Tom Peters to Marshall, Jim Kuzis, et cetera. I've had a lot of support from men through the years. So I did a lot of interviews and uh, we couldn't sell it. We couldn't sell it. And the reason we couldn't is the, the publishers said something consistent. So, you know, it's probably they're accurate. They all said there is no market for this book. None. Men have no interest in reading a book about what's wrong with them. And furthermore, you sell so many of your books through workshops and conferences. And there are no workshops or conferences for men on how on how to you know be better leaders for women. So you don't have a venue to sell this book. So it was a pretty, I mean, it was consistent. We had about 18 turndowns. 
So I thought, okay, I get it. That's fine. Make it obvious. This I, I don't want to write a book that doesn't have an audience. And uh, But I kept the proposal. And when it came time to write Rising Together, I found that a lot of, a number of the interviews that I had done for that book actually helped shape this book. So this book is, you know, as, as you know from reading the book, it, the impetus for writing this book was really that question I had from an executive at the Construction Super Conference in Las Vegas, where I was delivering a women's leadership program that 70% men showed up for. And this executive said, don't waste your time telling us why this is important. Guess what? There had been an evolution between 2012 and when this conference was, which I think was in 2019. Don't waste your time telling us why this is important. We get it. The talent base we're drawing from is very diverse and we're not doing a very good job. But what we don't understand is how to do it. We don't have a clue. So that was when he said that, I thought, okay, mm. that's definitely my next book. Uh, how to do this. So this is a very practical book that's focused on helping uh, both men and women as individuals get better at building these relationships, but also helping leaders understand how to build inclusive cultures because a lot of what they have been doing for recent in recent years hasn't been terribly effective. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was reading your book with it, the echoes in my head of I've been reading a lot from of a psychologist named Terry Real, who's a, a, a couples therapist. And his approach is very different than the traditional, which is sort of like the therapist is completely neutral. And he says, yes. basically, men and women are coming in to, to within this patriarchal society. And as a stereotype, the man tends to be like grandiose and the woman tends to be subservient. And instead, and his says, like, my first, the first thing we've got to do is to deal with the guy. Like, we've got to show him the, like, what's going to happen if he keeps going this way so that he has incontrovertible evidence. It seems like the world between 2012 and 2019 showed a lot of men and a lot of companies, okay, we better get serious about this. What, whether it's for, you know, fear of litigation, of, of, of social opprobrium from Me Too. Um, I'm curious what you think changed. Like, what, what, were, what were the, the key, um, you know, half Nelsons that, <laughs> that kind of woke up men and male leadership? Well, a couple of things I think came together. One uh, is that it's it's interesting. They, uh, you know, the whole idea in the uh, late '90s of the war for talent. You know, we're in a war for talent, uh, and it made organizations very focused on what they needed to do to address employee concerns because it was a real shortage of the kind of talent that they needed at that time. And then we went into kind of a dot-com induced recession. And what I noticed, because I, I used to speak at a lot of War for Talent conferences, what I noticed was that all of a sudden they were over and some of them were canceled. And I think the thinking was, oh, it's in a recession. The War for Talent is cyclical. And so we don't have to worry about it for a while. Well, Peter Drucker, going way back to the early 90s, had said the changes in the nature of the economy, the shift to a knowledge economy means that the need for talent is no longer cyclical. Even in times of recession, talent has always got to be the focus. And I think that there was a recognition of this after the 2008 recession, because it was so severe and in its effects and that a lot of people saw that that they needed, even through that very difficult time, to, to retain talented people, knowledge workers. They needed it because more and more, the organization's value is determined by its people. 
not so much by the, you know, the product and service, which has, which is dependent on the people. It's less dependent upon the materials, the commodities that are part of it. Um, batteries are probably an exception at this point. Will no longer will not be after t a certain amount of time, as it gets more commodified. But that 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 people are are that companies the value of products and services depends upon the people. So I think a lot of a lot of companies began to get that message, even if they weren't specifically articulating it. A lot of leaders began to understand it, and then at the same time. The, the global talent pool became ever more diverse because of factors like increasing immigration, um, you know, uh, special visas for talented workers, uh, more and more women flooding into the workplace, women's educational achieve, uh, attainments going through the roof, men's declining. Uh, Etc. So you you had an uh, of course there was um, you know far more uh, people of color in the workplace, people of color in positions that could, you know, you know for management and leadership, etc. So this diversity, the recognition of the dependence of organizations on talent. All that kind of came into play. And so companies began to realize, you know, what we need, okay, diversity, that it, it, it's a good thing to do and a good branding, et cetera. But also we've got to get very good at leading and managing diversity and attracting and retaining diverse talent, or we are not going to remain competitive. You look at a old line industry like construction or utilities that have so many retirements because just because of the aging out of the big pool of baby boomers. So they have to replace those people. And, uh, you know, guess who's in the talent pool? It's not just a bunch of, you know, fresh faced young men who want white men who want to come to work. It's a huge, um, you know, hugely diverse group. So how do you do that? And I've always made a very sharp distinction between diversity and inclusion. A lot of, you know, people sort of confuse them. Diversity is the nature of the global talent pool. So it's a reality uh, in which organizations are functioning. And, um, and inclusion is the means by which diverse talent um, is, is, is led to achieve its full potential because people who come from outside the traditional leadership mainstream are accustomed to feeling more excluded. They are more likely to feel excluded and in subtle ways to be excluded. So that's why the two actually go together. Diversity is not a goal like a lot of executives will tell me. No, <laughs> it's your reality. It's not a goal. Um, so... So I think that that this message came through because of changes in the talent pool, changes in the recognition that organizations were really so dependent on their human talent. I'm trying to replace it now. Good luck with that. But um, it, it's it's it really led to quite a shift. But they didn't necessarily have the how, and that's what I was trying to uh, provide here. Uh -huh. Gotcha. So I want to get to the how and the, and the richness of the book in a minute, but can I push back a little on um, the idea yeah, that diversity course. is not a goal? Because, like, you know, so my favorite sport is ultimate frisbee, and we like diversity okay. is definitely a goal there, like, based on the sort of the socioeconomic history of the sport. Um, hmm. It's all it's largely white um, and Asian, and like very, very few black players. And I also hear things like in places like Google and, you know, tech companies, you know, or, and in medical, like I do a lot of work with, with health, with in the medical world. And, and like, we know that black patients get much better care from black doctors for various reasons. They have much better health outcomes and like cardio, cardio school, you know, cardiology schools are having trouble recruiting like there does seem to be like we need more people who don't look like us. 
And, and so I'm wondering, like, when I think of that, I do think of like diversity as a goal. Like we've got to find those people and make them want to be here somehow. And well, you what, know, am I, what am I missing? Really is, that, is No, no, that's very helpful pushback. Uh, and I think, I think that's, that's true. I'm thinking more of, you know, global talent. They're trying to hire a lot of people uh, and they find they have a very diverse pool of talent, like a construction, utilities, aircraft manufacturing, whatever it is. Uh, that's the reality of their pool. But you, you know, you're right. I mean, your example of black physicians is is very, very resonant. Um, and uh, yeah, 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 you, you're right in that. I, I should probably stop saying diversity is not a goal. I'm trying to distinguish between diversity and inclusion, but I'm probably going overboard. So thank you for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, really? Yeah. So, so before I, the other thing I wanted to the other thing I wanted to say before we get to the triggers is you you used a word that I kind of oriented the whole book around in my mind, which is solidarity. And yeah. and that word has a lot of of emotional weight for me. I grew up. My dad was a a leftist activist labor leader. So I cannot sing Solidarity Forever, of, of which I know, you know, three verses by heart without tearing up. And, and I was really curious because it's, it's such a, like an, almost like an archaic word, like you were using like a Shakespearean phraseology, like to use the word solidarity and retrofitting it. Um, I'm curious what, what drew you to that word? Well, it really does go with the concept of retrofitting. First of all, solidarity has been a guiding principle of every successful uh, revol uh, transformational social movement, whether you think of back to, in our country, the civil rights movement, in our country, the, um, the development of women's rights and, and the early feminist movement. They, they had principles of solidarity. They worked well when the principles of solidarity remained in place. They worked poorly when they became factionalized and fell apart. The early labor movement was built very much on solidarity. And of course, we should not ever forget that it was the powerful influence of uh, the, uh, the solidarity union in Poland that was probably as, that certainly was as responsible as anything for pushing uh, the Soviet, the old Soviet Union over the, um, over the edge. And it was that, that there was a solidarity in that nation around trying to fight for their freedom uh, and a unity that was very, very powerful. And it is a powerful force. And I think that, it, and that was the exact language that I used, it needs to be retrofitted for a new era, because in, in our era, it has come to be associated often with trade unions and manual labor. That's where the whole idea of solidarity and labor belongs there. But we've got a very different kind of situation uh, where most people are not doing manual labor in organizations. That is increasingly automated, but you still have huge numbers of people in organizations. And guess what? I was just reading this morning, latest poll number shows 70% of them feel disengaged. Now, nobody is participating in a movement where solidarity is valued and important feels disengaged. They all feel that they have a role to play. So I think that mm. leaders need to take this seriously and think of what do we need to do to create real solidarity within our organizations? I feel like I'm going to tear up as well. Because people need to feel engaged. People need to feel like they know why they come to work. They need to feel what, how they are valued. It's not happening. It's not happening. 
in organizations uh, now. There's a tremendous lack yeah. in general of feelings of solidarity and loyalty. And it, you know, starts at the top. Yeah. You know, and, and when I grew up, solidarity always meant the workers against the company. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, so here exactly. we're talking about something. It is different. Go ahead. Yes. And you know, I think of Alan Mulally's tenure at Ford. And you've heard Alan talk about this. You've heard Marshall Goldsmith, our colleague, who's so close to Alan and was his coach uh, for years, talk about this. But Ford, Alan took over as CEO of Ford in, I think it was right around 2000. It was around 2000, 2003. And uh, morale was horrendous, and there was a tremendous division and constant um, fighting between management and labor, and that was just seen as the normal order of the world. When Allen left Ford Motor Company, when he left his tenure as CEO, he had 98% approval rating from employees including unionized employees who, because of how Ford was run under his tenure, felt as if they were treated with respect, felt as if they belonged, felt as if they were an essential and integral part of the culture rather than in opposition to it. So, which had been sort of the historic role of, of labor uh, and, you know, reflective of some of its roots in, you know, revolution, revolutionary movements in, you know, mid 19th century Europe. So it, 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 that is remarkable. And it's, it's a very, very positive thing. One of my ways, how do I define inclusive an inclusive culture. I'm often asked that. And one of the ways is that, and you can, and this is very obvious, is that people talk about their organization as we, not they. And that's what was happening with Alan. You get 98% hmm. approval. It's because people feel as if they are part of a larger we. And this is something we all want to feel. We all want to feel as if we are part of something greater than ourselves. And to do that in a positive sense and to align that with the work we do every day, you know, which is, is such a part of our lives, it is, is, is a great thing. And that's why I think that, that I, 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 you, you know, you're making me think about it because I'm now des designing the workshop for different groups, different levels of, of, of people in organizations, but that I, I do want to emphasize this, this concept of solidarity more, because I think it's a very, it's a very powerful one. And it's a strong yearning in people's hearts for, um, you know, to feel mm -hmm. solidarity. Yeah. Well, I, I have a question that I'm not sure how it's going to come out. So I might need to sort of workshop it a little bit. Um, right. But so like what you said when we first started started talking was about like this is about behaviors versus, you know, bi bias and mindset. And like the word that the, that solidarity is replacing in my mind, although you don't you don't mention it specifically, is this idea of intersectionality. And so there's something about the way you wrote this book that is saying, like, I, I want to get all of the benefits of the, of, you know, of different identitarian movements, but without kind of the divisiveness or the baggage or the blaming. Like you talk a little bit about, you know, over, by, uh, sub unconscious bias workshops that can just make, you know, white men like me feel crappy about ourselves. And arguably, historically, on the average, we should. And yet there's a lot of, you know, great writing now by people of color specifically saying like that's not the way to change hearts and minds is to make people feel bad and like the tone of your book is very like you're an anthropologist just looking without judging 
at like, oh, this is lo- what humor has looked like. And this is what the old boys network has looked like. And I'm wondering, like, how, maybe I'll just stop there and just let you reflect because I, I, I don't really have a question, but it just felt like you're saying something to these identitarian movements about ways in which they can make progress without, you know, triggering immune responses in, in society and organizations. That's a really good metaphor. Um, yes, I think the, the the rise of identity politics is completely understandable. Uh, but because people who have felt marginalized, excluded, as if they can't be themselves, you know, gay people, trans people in particular, but also people of color and probably to a lesser extent women, although women have had to endure so much, uh, you know, harassment, um, you know, which was what the madman era was all about. But, you know, that so it's understandable that people should become invested in their identity. But once you become overly invested, you undermine your ability to create solidarity outside the group. You just do because you're 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 focused on your identity the identity of people that you perceive as being like you, number one, it quickly becomes factionalized. And and I've watched that from the start, the women's movement. I remember in um, one of the first, and now was the big NOW, was the first big women's organization that advocated for women's rights. And it was quite powerful in the late 60s, early 70s. And I think they went, on, they had their third conference and it was sort of the writing is on the wall back in Houston. It was in Houston. And at that conference, they basically spent the entire time squabbling about uh, whether, you know, uh, women of color should have their own movement or they should be part of this and if they should be part of this how should the leadership function these are important questions but it was so focused on that that they ended up being a highly ineffective organization that was constantly squabbling focusing on difference rather than okay fine we're we're you know it's it's different for all of us what can we address together how can we help make this world better together instead of getting so focused on our our identitarian, as you say, silos that we become, you know, that we struggle to be able to relate to people who are outside of that, uh, outside of that uh, silo. And I think to some extent that has, you know, permeated organizations. I remember going to another conference. It was a diversity and inclusion conference. And I was listening to or participating in some event with the uh, head of HR at a major food, uh, you know, it's like chickens and eggs and stuff like that. Agricultural products company, we could call them. And they, and the, and the woman was saying, you know, we started a women's network. We started a network for uh, you know, our black employees, um, but then, you know, they were African-American employees mostly. And, uh, but then we realized we've got a lot of African employees because they do a lot of food packing. So we decided, should we have a thing, a separate thing for the African as opposed to the African-American, different issues. So we started an African thing and then we got objections that, you know, people weren't from different tribal groups. And if you were a luau, you didn't want to be working with this one. And she said, so we started different. We started um, this great practice where we have um, we have networks that are divided among tribal regions. And I thought, OK, this is the logical extent of this kind of identitarian thinking where it reverts to mm. tribalism. And that's what I saw in Houston at that at that big now conference. It was tribalism. So suddenly the white women are not thinking of what can we do to support women? They're thinking, oh, I'm a white woman. Do I just, you know, can I speak with these other women? This is the opposite of solidarity, the absolute opposite. 
So when I talk about solidarity, I'm not only talking about engagement and feeling a part of we, I'm talking about let's develop our skills so we can be more effective in our communications with, in building relationships, in building mutual support with people we may perceive as different than ourselves and not just focus upon the fact that they're different. Because guess what? When you're focused upon that, you're not very effective at communicating with those people. Uh, so we're, we're kind of losing our chops on that, I think. Hmm. That's beautiful. So before before we go, I do want to talk about the the some of the content in the book, and you you framed it in terms of triggers, which I thought was was surprising and brilliant because it wasn't about generalities and here's how because you know, everybody knows kind of how they should behave. Not, not everybody, but enough people. But like the the understand like a trigger is something that like gets you you know, emotionally roiled up where your best stuff isn't likely to come out unless you have prepared, right? Where where the way you think you should act or you want to act or the way they taught you to act in that seminar, right? So um, can you talk a little bit about what, how, how you thought about using triggers as kind of the central organizing principle of the book? Sure. Um, and, and you're exactly right. People come out of ste- seminars and they may feel that they have some very good intentions or their eyes have been open. They've had an aha moment about something they've been doing that gets in their way. So they resolve they're going to change it. And it works for a time until they have an emotional response to something that happens. And this is what triggers are. Triggers are environmental. They don't lie within us. They are you know, people, they can be situations, they can be events that happen where we feel sudden, we have an emotional response uh, of some degree of pain, it can be anger, resentment, frustration, disappointment, and that's our response. Now, that's fine. There is nothing wrong with being triggered. We all get triggered in certain situations. Uh, But the issue is, what do we do when we're triggered? And it seemed to me that all the all the workshops and all the training and all the effort that's going in organizations uh, to dealing with issues of inclusion, equity and inclusion, doesn't address what to do when people feel triggered, which is when they act, tend to act in ways that do not serve them and do not serve Uh, other people as well. Um, So, you know, let's be specific here. Uh, Visibility is the first trigger. And and by the way, I was calling them stumbling blocks. That's what I was calling them in the book. And then uh, Marshall and I were in a discussion and he was talking a little bit about triggers, which is a book he wrote years ago, not related at all to these issues of inclusion or, or dealing with diversity. And he mentioned something in triggers book I admired a lot. And I thought, oh, triggers is a much better word than stumbling block. So I said, Marshall, I think I'm going to rip off your Hmm. word triggers and use it in the book I'm writing now. And he said, what a great idea. (laughs) So there we are. Um, (laughs) So that's, I I do think triggers really, really captures it because it is about a stumbling block is more, um, you know, mental. And a, a trigger is something that, you know, we get. We feel something. So let's let's give an example um, that would be around the first trigger in the book, which is visibility. You feel that you have a hard time getting seen, getting noticed, getting recognized for what you say or for what you do, what you contribute, whereas somebody else, either because they're part of the mainstream, they have a more developed network than you do, they're at a higher position, whatever the reason, is very, very, or they're just comfortable with self-promotion, is very, very good at getting that kind of credit. And we've all felt ourselves in these situations. And uh, this happens a lot across 
bounds, uh, especially of gender or race, where people feel, you know, I did that, no one noticed. I said that in a meeting, no one seemed to notice. And then this, you know, guy who's very well connected or has a high position said the same thing and everybody said, oh, what a great idea. So, okay, that happens, say, in a meeting. We say something, no one notices, someone else says it, and they get, you know, like, oh, great idea. They get a lot of affirmation. So so we feel triggered. We feel like, okay, no, they can't see me. Nothing I can do here breaks through. Um, I'm undervalued, and uh, these people are jerks. So what do you do with that trigger? You know, that's the issue. That's when you start... That's when it becomes harder to keep that sort of glow that you get on lead on, upon leaving the seminar room. Uh, it becomes difficult. You're in some degree of pain. So you have, you're aware of it. And what do you do? Uh, often you just suppress it. It's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it is here. That's where the disengagement comes in. So when you do that, when you suppress it, over time, and you've done that enough, you definitely disengage because how do you remain engaged in an organization or a company where you don't feel that you're recognized? It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So the other thing you can do is vent about it. And this is very common, you know, grab someone, say you're a woman, you grab a, a female friend going out of that meeting. Did you see what just happened? These guys are such jerks. They can't hear us, you know. Uh, and then you 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 sort of bond in a way. Um, it may make you feel better. But none of these responses help to move us forward. None of these responses become occasions for being able to communicate uh, uh, with the people that we feel triggered by. Uh, so they just keep us stuck. So in the book, what I try to do for each one of the triggers is suggest a range of ways that you can deal with the trigger. You want to be aware when you are triggered. You want to accept the fact that you are triggered. But you also, so three A's here, but you also want to take action. Because if you don't take action, you will either feel worse and worse or you will become cynical, embittered, and it will undermine your ability to build relationships across bounds. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do there. I'm trying to really get real as opposed to talk about, you know, how we should be and how we should think and how we should act. But, you know, what is an effective way to act in a situation where we're really struggling, where we're angry, where we feel resentment. That, that chapter was actually the hardest one for me because maybe it was because the first one. And I kept thinking like, it's not, you know, it's not up to the women. It's up to the men. It's up to the leadership. It's up to the men to kind of recognize, like they need to go to the workshops. And, and I could feel myself getting triggered. Like, wow. like one of the beautiful things about the writing in the book is that whoever you're talking about, whoever's perspective you're bringing, I, I was empathizing with, even when it was, you know, the men who were making jokes and feeling like these, you know, these other people can't take a joke. I have to be too careful. Like I was feeling that too. Right. <laughs> so, so when, when, you know, so it, it kind it kind of was a bit of a challenge for me to say, okay, well, so yeah, there is no such thing as like should or fair, like this is what it is. Yeah. Acceptance isn't about weakness. Acceptance is about real is you need the acceptance before you can take the action. Um, and so what, what are some actions? Let's not leave people hanging too much. I know okay. everyone needs to get the book, but what, like, what are some of the things that people can do when they feel like they are, you know, speaking, not getting recognized, not being heard, not being acknowledged. And some bozo says the same thing and, and confetti falls from the ceiling. One of the ones I've had most effective, most uh, success with in coaching and in the workshops that I do. It has to do with rewriting the script. So the issue is when we feel triggered, we tell ourselves a story. We we have something that explains it, you know, which is usually these, guys, you know, they're bozos. These guys can't hear women. I'm mean, just using this this one example. 
um, you know, they don't really respect women. They don't know how to listen. Uh, they all stick together. You know, this is a network I, women can't penetrate. Whatever the story is, we tell ourselves. Uh, we do that to explain what just happened. And the story can make us feel good, but none of those stories, you know, give you any path to action. I mean, either you just stay stuck and either vent or don't say anything, or you, you know, go to the wall and take it to HR and lodge a formal complaint. Well, you can't do it in a situation like that. This is an everyday trigger. This is not harassment. This does not rise to the level of a formal complaint, much less, God forbid, a lawsuit. All it's going to do is blow up your own career. So, so one way to take action is to question your own story. Okay, that's what I think happened. But there may be another explanation. Maybe he didn't hear me. You know, maybe he was paying attention to something else. Uh, and, and maybe he was just trying to amplify my point of view. Uh, but whatever happened, um, how, whatever the cause, what happened actually there was he affirmed something that I had suggested. So what um, I'm going to choose to give him the benefit of my goodwill and decide that the real story is he heard me, he liked the idea, and he was just reframing it. Then that gives me a path to action because I can go up to him afterwards. I can call him the next day, email him, whatever, drop by the office if indeed you're back at the office and say something like, you know, I noticed that in that meeting you, you affirmed what I'd said, my suggestion about such and such. I was so happy to hear that you agreed with me. Uh, would you like to meet about this? Maybe there's a way we can help move this project or this idea forward. So you can do that. So you're reaching out to him. It gives you a way to see if you might be able to enlist him as an ally. Guess what? Everybody in the room already heard what he said. You know, some of them may silently have thought, wow, he's just saying what she said. You know, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. He's mm. now in the picture. That's the acceptance. This happened. Um, and, you you know, at the time, if you thought of it, you could have very effectively said, oh, I'm so glad you agree with my idea. Thank you. Saying it in a the way that has zero sarcasm or, you know, or assumption that you're, you know, you know what he's up to, but just affirming that. But often we don't think of doing that in the moment. So this gives you a path to effective action. Now, two things. The first is that it doesn't matter whether we think that story is actually true. It really doesn't. It's our story. We're just trying to find a path to action. So it doesn't matter. And that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, what the way people usually object to this, you know, with coaching clients, for example, with rewriting the script is number one, um, this makes me a pushover. Why do I have to be the one who rewrites the script? It, you know, it, it doesn't make you a pushover because you're the one who's rewriting the script. It's your script and you're doing it to give yourself a possible path to action. So it's your decision. You're not being a pushover. Uh, the other thing is because you don't have to believe the narrative. People say, well, I'm not really comfortable being fake. You know, I believe that I need to be authentic and true to myself. So why would I uh, write a story in my mind that I don't think is actually the truth? And this is, would you rather be authentic or what, would you rather be effective and have a way to deal with this that can create new possibilities in the situation. Which do you choose? It's what, you know, Marshall calls um, the, uh, you know, an excessive need to be me, that idea, you know, like I'm going to stay true to myself no mm -hmm. matter what, no matter what's involved. So I've found that to be extremely effective and very simple. It diffuses some of the anger, some of the energy around the emotional response evoked by that 
trigger. It's a creative kind of exercise. You know, you can fill in a lot of details about the whole story that happened. And that can, can, can give you a path for channeling some of that energy. But then it also provides a way to act and, 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 and a way to act that potentially expands your range of allies and relationships with someone you perceive of as not only different from, from you, but, but as, as not necessarily hostile to you, but disrespecting you at some level. Yeah. So as, as I'm still struggling with that a little bit. Um, I, so I, th uh -huh. I think the mindset that you come at that is, is really important because I could easily see this turn into self gaslighting. Right. Where, OK, I have to believe this positive thing when I know it's not true. And I'm thinking about Marshall's, you know, um, um, innovation around feed forward rather than feedback. I think the, the way to be powerful here is to think about it as I'm actually going to not rewrite my story just, but I'm going to rewrite his story so that he starts believing and starts acting that way in the future. Right. Like, so I'm, oh, I'm going to frame this in terms of I actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, like I, I'm the I'm the screenwriter here. I'm writing this movie. That's really good. I'm going to think of that in terms of my workshop, because actually that's what often happens. You go up to that person and you say, you know, thanks for supporting what I said. I really appreciated that, even though you feel that maybe they were trying to steal your idea. And then their response, I've done this, I've done this dozens of times. I'm not talking about as a coach, I mean as a person operating in the world. You'll say that, thanks for supporting. I'm glad to know that that you agreed with it and echoed what I said. Uh, and the person will say, yeah, yeah, I was really impressed by your idea. Uh, that, 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 that was terrific. I'm, you know, I'm here for you or something like that. And so, and and half the time they end up believing it. They believe that that's why they did it, even if that's not why they did it and they didn't notice. It kind of doesn't matter. That's what happened. Um, and you accept it. You're aware of your feelings. You accept what happened. But you're right. You're, you're not even just so much rewriting the script for yourself. You're rewriting the script for them and offering them a chance to believe that that's the actual story so that they can, you know, develop a, a more useful relationship with you. I love that. I love that. So yeah. I'm looking at the time we're, we're, we're about, I've, I've oh, taken up as much of your, more of your time as I promised. Um, I'm <laughs> loving this conversation. And, you know, there's a, a bunch of other triggers from, uh, you know, humor, attraction. I love the chapter on like, you know, physical sexual attraction in the workplace as like just the fact that you acknowledge that, oh, this is a thing that happens and <laughs> not blaming and shaming anyone for being a human being. Um, so I definitely recommend everybody get um, rising together. Uh, what just before you go, how can people follow you, stay in touch and keep learning from you? Sure. Um, uh, my website uh, SallyHelgeson.com has a contact button. So I get every day I get uh, emails from people that have used the contact button. Uh, I get a notification and respond. So that's one way. I'm also on LinkedIn and Twitter um, and, um, and more responsive, I think, on Twitter than I am on LinkedIn, even though I have a much, much, much smaller um, you know, following or, or people that I'm engaged with. But uh, oh. so I'm I'm easy to be in touch with in terms of that. So it's it's just Sally um, Sally Helgeson .com. Um, and uh, and the books Great. are available. and uh, as a recipient of your newsletter. Oh, and my newsletter. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, my Substack newsletter, which I've got to write today somehow. Uh, yes, my Substack uh. newsletter, and and I explore all kinds of things on the newsletter. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. All right. Yeah, and um, and people can get to that from the website as well. They can get to that through the website. They can, um, you know, they can get to it through, uh, yeah, through the website through Substack. Uh, but it's also posted on LinkedIn uh, after it goes out on Substack. Okay, I'll throw a bunch of links into the show notes 
for, for this episode. Oh, thank you, Howard. So, Sally yeah. Helgeson, yeah, it was a, pl a pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure to read this beautifully written and heartfelt and incredibly practical book. And so I, I, I wish the book much success in the world and, and thank you for all you do and for taking the time today. I got to write that down. Beautifully written. Yeah. Beautifully written. <laughs> the last one was incredibly practical. And there was one and in the heartfelt. Middle. Heartfelt. Oh, thank you. I love that. Much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, Howie. All right. Well, take care. Thanks so much, Sally. Yeah, you take care too. Good to be with you.